this evening, and uh, especially if you're a guest with us tonight, we welcome you to this service tonight. We're so glad to have you with us this evening. Amen. To all that are joining us online, wherever you're watching from this evening, we welcome you as a part of this service as well. Amen. Praise God. Would you stand while well, maybe a few more are still giving? We are going to uh, move on into the Word of the Lord. I know some of you have uh, you've heard this, you know this. So a reminder for you, and then perhaps some of you, you've never perhaps heard this explained, but as pretty much most of you here tonight know, we, we have three services every week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Thursday night. And, and there really is, um, there's an intentional focus of each service. And that's not to say that sometimes kind of that focus doesn't bleed over into another service, but... Uh, I, I come into every service uh, mindful of the, of the focus. And so, for example, or, or what I mean by that is Sunday morning is, tends to be uh, more geared ministry preaching towards those that are our guests, visitors, people that aren't necessarily a part of us. That doesn't mean that if you're a part of the church, you don't receive something. In fact, sometimes God uses that and just sneaks in the side door and you got your guard down, you weren't, you know. And then Sunday night tends to be more towards the church, and then Thursday night is typically teaching, training, equipping. And uh, today is a little bit unique because it's, it's going to kind of be, a, I think, a little more example of that because I, I'm going to use some things that are uh, kind of similar to what I used this morning here in the service in Arnold, except it's going to be a completely different focus. This morning was geared toward guests, those that may not be a part of this congregation, but tonight is going gonna, is gonna to be geared to the church. So if you've ever wondered why, Pastor, why do we have three services a week? Some people only have one, some have two. That's, that's why. And uh, with that being said, if you turn to Second Chronicles chapter 6, I'm going to read two verses here, and then I'm going to read a verse I read this morning. So 2 Chronicles 6, and beginning with verse number 32. Moreover, concerning the stranger, which is not of thy people Israel, but is come from a far country for thy great name's sake, and thy mighty hand and thy stretched out arm, if they come and pray in this house, and, and this chapter is actually Solomon's uh, dedicatory prayer for the temple, and so this is a part of that prayer. If, if they come and pray in this house, if the stranger comes and prays in this house, then hear thou from the heavens, even from thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calleth thee for. That all people, somebody say all people, that all people of the earth may know thy name and fear thee as doth thy people Israel and may know that this house which I have built is called by thy name. Ephesians 2.19, again a verse I used this morning, Paul says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. You used to be strangers. You used to be foreigners, but you're not that anymore. You are now fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of being in your presence again this evening, the opportunity you've given us once again to join together in worshiping and lifting up the name that is above every name. Lord, we could never praise you and worship you enough. You've done so much for us that any amount of praise and worship we would ever give you would still not be enough based on what you deserve. And so thank you for a chance to do it again this evening with people of like precious faith, Lord. And thank you for once again responding to our worship 
letting your presence fill this place. Now I pray, God, that you would speak to us. I pray that you would speak to us as a congregation tonight. God, I believe that in these first couple of months of this year, we have already seen some things that we could consider to be unprecedented, but I believe, God, we haven't even seen the the full extent of what that word you gave us means. And so I pray that you would continue shaping us and molding us and preparing us, equipping us as a congregation for the fulfillment of your word to us, Lord. I trust you again tonight, Father. I depend upon you for your anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm not going to take a lot of time with it if you weren't here this morning and a lot of you are in other places for ministry, so you're welcome to go back and watch the full message. But just a little bit of context in case you weren't. Paul is, Paul is talking here and he's addressing the Gentiles and he's tell, talking to them about the fact that there was, there was a point at which you were not allowed in to the things of God. If you were not A Jew, you didn't have access to what they had access to, but he's saying now that you're you're no more strangers and you're no longer foreigners, but you are now fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You are not... You are not a second-class citizen. There, there are no rankings in the family of God from important to less important. There, we are all equally a part of the, of the family of God. We are all equally fellow citizens. I thought somebody might be a little excited about that, but that's okay. But he, he, he says you're, you're no longer strangers. You're no longer strangers and for, you used to be strangers. But this idea, and as, as most of you know, English is not the original language of the Bible, New Testament, Greek, Old Testament is Hebrew. And, and so sometimes there's, a, there's the same English word, Old and New Testament, but the original word might mean something a little bit different than the, the English word. And I, I, I uh, for the most part, this word stranger and strangers throughout Scripture basically means the, it means the same thing. I said it this morning, uh, there are 70 times in uh, Exodus through uh, Deuteronomy, 70 times that you'll find the word stranger. Not counting the word strangers that is also in there a lot of times. And not every single time that word stranger is found in those four books is it specifically addressing the treatment of the stranger, but a lot of times it is. And it seems as though God went out of His way to emphasize to the children of Israel how to treat the stranger. And I believe part of the significance of that is because God in His foreknowledge knew that where you and I would be today, we are spiritual Israel. And He he dealt with natural Israel about how to treat the stranger Because he wanted the church to know how to treat the stranger. Most of you here tonight at some point were a stranger. Most of you, you you weren't born and raised here. Those... There's a growing number of people born and raised here. Uh, but, but, but there's a lot of you. You came in, you were a stranger. Some of you came in, you were a stranger, and you were a little strange. But for the grace of God. And, and, and God emphasized to the children of Israel, and I, I find it interesting that in, as a part of Solomon's prayer, somehow God's attitude and concern about the stranger had been passed on to Solomon because in his prayer and dedicating the temple, he said, God, now concerning the stranger, which is 
not of thy people, Israel. They're not, a, they're not a part of the church, but they come from a far country for thy great name's sake. They, they've heard about you, God, and they come because they've heard about you, and, and they've heard of your mighty hand and your stretched out arm. God, if they come and praise in this house, then I'm asking you, God, to hear from heaven Hear the stranger, hear their prayer, and whatever it is they ask you to do, God. I wonder if as a congregation tonight we, could, we would be willing to say, you know what, God, and, and I realize what Solomon was praying there about that house is not identical, identical to what we're sitting here tonight as the house of God or a house. I know the church is the not the building, it's the people. I know all of that, but but let's just use that a little bit. What 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 would be would be back up. Would we be willing? I wonder how many of us would be willing to say, you know what, God, if you never answer another prayer, I pray in this sanctuary. God, if you never grant me one more request of mine in this sanctuary. If you'll just do one favor, God, every stranger that walks through these doors that's not a part of this church, this congregation, God, we're asking you when they pray and when they ask you, God, if even if you don't do what all we ask you, we're asking God that whatever the stranger pray, if the stranger needs healing, God, heal the stranger. If the stranger needs deliverance, God, he deliver the stranger. If the stranger needs a financial blessing. God, give the stranger a financial blessing. If the stranger needs an inner healing, God, give the stranger an inner healing. But just let the stranger know that even though they're a stranger, when they pray and acknowledge you for who you are, that you will hear and you will answer. Was, that was a significant part of his prayer. Let me go to Exodus chapter 12. Again, this is in the reference, what I was referencing, where these 70 times we find the word stranger. Just, just one of the examples, Exodus 12 and 48. This is the Lord speaking, giving instruction. When a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord. Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. If if somebody that is a stranger, they weren't born as 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 an Israelite, but they're willing to obey. Let it be as if they were born. As an Israelite. I want everybody that when you were born, your parents were already apostolic. I want you to stand young or older and old. Your parents were already born again apostolics. Now everybody that your parents weren't apostolic when you were born, stand with the rest of them. The Lord says, doesn't matter if you were born in the house or not. If you're willing to be a part of the house, let it be as if you were born. I acknowledge you can be seated. I acknowledge that because of being raised in the church, there, there are that you ought, you should. One of the saddest things is when somebody raised in the church ends up collecting as much baggage as somebody that wasn't. One of the benefits I've found of being raised in the church is the fact that if you'll do your best to follow God's plan and will and purpose for your life, you, you can, you're still going to get some baggage because life is life, but it can be less. But outside of that, one is not better than the other. And the Lord said to natural Israel... Even if someone was not born as a part of you, if they're willing to become a part, let it be as if they were born one of you. Now now watch this. 
Numbers 35. You're not going to necessarily see that word stranger quite as much, but, but I think it connects to this. Numbers 35 and verse number 1 says this. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Command the children of Israel that they give unto the Levites of the inheritance of their possession cities to dwell in. And you shall give also unto the Levites suburbs for the cities round about them. And the cities shall they ha- and, and the cities shall they have to dwell in, and the suburbs of them shall be for their cattle and for their goods and for all their beasts. And the suburbs of the cities which you shall give unto the Levites shall reach from the wall of the city and outward a thousand cubits round about. And you shall measure from without the city on the east side two thousand cubits and on the south side two thousand cubits and on the west side two thousand cubits and on the north side two thousand cubits and the city shall be in the midst. This shall be to them the suburbs of the cities. And among the cities which you shall give unto the Levites, there shall be six cities for refuge, which you shall appoint for the manslayer, that he may flee thither, and to them you shall add forty and two cities. Skipping down to verse 11, then you shall appoint Then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither which killeth any person at unawares. And they they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. And of these cities, and of these cities which you shall give six cities, Shall you have for refuge? You shall give three cities on this side, Jordan, and three cities shall you give in the land of Canaan, which shall be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be a refuge both for the children of Israel and for the stranger. And for the sojourner among them, that every one that killeth any person unawares may flee. And so this this is God's instructions to Moses. They're still in the wilderness. They haven't entered the promised land yet, but God's giving instruction and he's telling them he's telling him in advance, when you start to get settled in the promised land, I want you to establish these these cities of refuge. Again, Three of them are supposed to be on the side of Jordan that you're on now, but then you're supposed to establish three of them in the promised land. And so in Joshua chapter 20, they're now in the promised land. Joshua is now the one leading the children of Israel. And the Lord now says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge whereof I speak unto you, by, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses. So what I told Moses to do, I want you to now do. That the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger, uh, the avenger of blood. And when he that doth flee unto one of those cities shall stand at the entering end of the gate of the city and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city unto them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. In essence, what's being said here is you're to appoint these cities and in the context of what's being said, if somebody kills somebody accidentally, there's a place for them to run to and find safety, find refuge. Or according to what we read, that was for the children of Israel, but it was also for the stranger. I want you to provide a place that the stranger can run to, find safety. That that the one in this context, figuratively speaking, it would it would be the it would be the enemy of our soul who's trying to hunt us down and make us pay for the mistakes we've made. And so spiritually speaking, God is saying, I I want there to be a a place of refuge. One of the things that's interesting, and I thought maybe it was in my notes, but I'm not seeing it there. There's another place where he says, 
In essence, he says, I want you to start with these six cities. But as you expand, as you take more territory, I want you to add more cities of refuge. I think they start at 5 o'clock, so they may be done by now, but this evening there was service being held at College Park, University of Maryland. You know what that is? That's a city of refuge. That's, that's trying to get the place of refuge out of one spot, one location. That, that's, we, we got service in the afternoon in Glen Burnie, and, and, and uh, we got it this morning in Deal, and our Hispanic group met this afternoon. That's, that's trying to get the city of refuge. Not saying you got to come to a building to be saved. That's not what I'm saying. But it's about making sure that for the stranger that needs some place to go to find safety, that they can find some place to get to, that they can find that place of refuge to, to be able to get through, get over what they've done. God established. This wasn't, they weren't sitting around and somebody just came up with the idea to have these cities of refuge. This was God's idea. It's God's idea to make a way for you. It's God's idea to bless you. It's God's idea to help you. It's God's idea to prosper you. That didn't originate with you. You've got a heavenly Father that's looking out for you even if you don't feel like He's looking out for you. Even if you can't see the evidence of it. Even before you know what's coming tomorrow. He's already looking ahead and He's already made a way when there seems to be no way. you to make these cities. I, I want a place for the stranger. I want a place where the stranger can go and not be a stranger anymore. I want a place where the person that's been rejected can go and not be rejected anymore. I, I want a place where the person that's been abused can go and not be abused anymore. I, I, I want a place where a person that's been beaten down can go with people's words to be able to go and not be beaten down anymore. That was God's idea. God's idea. We're not here tonight because some human being came up with an idea. Let's get together and have a religious gathering on Sunday morning and Sunday night. I realize the Bible doesn't tell us exactly when we have to gather, to gather when we have to gather, but it tells us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together and do it even more as the day approaches because we're living in a broken world where it seems like the brokenness of our world is increasing day by day. The stuff people are dealing with in our world is getting crazier and crazier. But I'm glad to know that you and I are a part of something that can be a place of safety and security that the stranger can go to and not continue to be a stranger, but you can become a fellow citizen. But all of that really foundational, and I don't know how much longer I'll preach tonight, but all of that really foundational to get to this. In Deuteronomy 19 and verse number 1, When the Lord thy God hath cut off the nations whose land the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their cities and their houses, be, when, when you've gotten to where I'm taking you, Again, you shall separate three cities for thee in the midst of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. Now watch this, verse, verse 3. Thou shalt prepare thee a way, and divide the coasts of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to inherit into three parts, that every slayer may flee thither. It's the first part of that, verse 3, and I realize it may not be obvious just at sort of face value, but he says, I want you to separate these three cities. But then in verse 3, he says, I want you to prepare thee a way. I want you to establish these places of refuge. But then... 
I want you to make sure that there is easy access to that place of refuge. I don't want you just to create or designate a city of refuge and then say, well, if they need it, they'll get there. If they need to find that place of refuge, well, hopefully they'll find it. If they need to find that place of refuge, hopefully they got GPS in their phone and they'll get there. He said, I want you to prepare a way. Listen to what a a couple of commentaries say about that simple statement of preparing a way. The Jews inform us that the roads, this is Adam Clark, the Jews inform us that the roads to the cities of refuge were made very broad. 32 cubits. And even so, and even so that there's, and even, they're supposed to be even, so that there should be no impediments in the way and were constantly kept in good repair. He said there's supposed to be 32 cubits. I know that the scripture says broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be that find that way and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that go that way. But can I say this to you tonight? The path to get to the narrow path is supposed to be a broad path. I said the path to get to the narrow path should be a broad path, meaning it provides a way for whomsoever will. The path to get to the path is not supposed to be exclusive. It's not supposed to be trying to keep people out. The scripture said whomsoever will. And so he said, I want you to make it 32 cubits. Since all of you here know what those dimensions are, I don't need to explain According to good old Mr. Google, a cubit is approximately 18 inches. So that means he was telling them, I want the road to the city of refuge to be about 48 feet wide. Brother Evans, you're my resident, um, what do you call it? Use it all. Tape measures. What, what's the width, roughly at least? What do you think the width of this building? 80 feet wide? 80, so 80 this way? So, that means from about me to there. He, 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 he didn't say, I want you to make a path. they got to somehow squeeze down that path. I don't even want an aisle. I looked it up today. That's about close to the width of a four-lane road. I want you to prepare a way, and I want it to be wide enough that you can ride four cars side by side on that road. I don't want it to be difficult to get to that city. I don't want it to be hard for people to get to that place of refuge. I'm concerned about the stranger, and I'm concerned about the mistakes he makes, and and I'm concerned about the the sins that he commits that are not intentional, premeditated, and sin is sin, I understand. But he's saying, "I, I, I want there to be a place of refuge, but I want it to be easy to get to that place of refuge. Barnes note says this about that same thing. It was the duty of the Senate to repair the roads that led to the cities of refuge annually and remove every obstruction. No hillock was left, no river over which there was not a bridge, and the road was at least 32 cubits broad. At crossroads... At crossroads, there were posts bearing the words, Refuge, refuge, to guide the fugitive in his flight. It seems as if in Isaiah 40 and 3, where it talks about preparing the way of the Lord, the imagery were borrowed from the preparation of the ways to the cities of refuge. 
I want it to be a broad path and then I want you to make sure on a regular basis that there's nothing in that path that is going to hinder the stranger to get to that city. I don't want there to be any obstacles. I don't want there to be bridges that are out that they got to somehow figure out. How am I going to get across the water? I want to make sure you, I want you to make sure the bridge is in order. I want you to make sure there's no obstacles on the road. When you get to the point that you're not sure which direction to go. I want you to make it clear which direction is the city of refuge because I want the stranger to be able to get there and find a place of safety. I've come to preach to this congregation tonight because I think we are seeing the beginning of a fresh harvest at Antioch Central. I believe we've got a city of refuge. I believe we've got a place for the stranger to come. But by the grace of God, let's make sure there's a path to get there and let's make sure that path isn't an obstacle course to get there, but there's an easy way to get to the place of refuge. Refuge. Oh, I, I don't. I, I've, I've heard people sometimes. I've heard people sometimes talk about what their life was like before they saved the, God saved them, and and they're they're sort of telling their testimony. But I've heard some people sometimes. I, I really wasn't so sure if they were telling their testimony or if they were actually expressing what they missed from their former life. Bragging about it, right, Brother Middleton. It was almost as if they were bragging about it. I don't think that should ever be. And, and you say, well, well, we'd never do that. Well, the children of Israel did that. They got outside of Egypt and after years of slavery and bondage and it intensified in the last little while before they left Egypt, it didn't take them very long out of Egypt to say, you know, we, we kind of miss what we had. And you miss what you had in Egypt? You, you miss a little bit of good food, but you forget the, the bondage you were living under. I say all of that to say I don't think we should ever, and those of you that weren't raised in church and God brought you out of the world, I, I don't think you should ever look back and glory in what you used to do and, and, and what the lifestyle you used to live. But I will tell you, I do think it's worthwhile every now and then and just think back a little bit to that you were dug out of I know some of you look real pretty tonight I know some of you cleaned up real well you don't have any stains anymore and you've been washed and made clean but that wasn't the way you were when you first came some of you when you first came you were so stained by sin you were so messed up by the life you had lived oh God don't forget the pit from which you were dug because if you can remember where he brought you from you can have grace on others to where God can bring them from I read it to you a couple of Thursday nights ago completely different context but Paul said I, I, I'm not worried about you judging me I'm not worried about your opinions of me and then he went on to say he said I don't even judge myself He said, I I don't even trust my own judgment of my own self. Ultimately, God's the only one that can judge because God's the only one that sees and knows everything. You and I don't even know our own hearts, much less somebody else's heart. Why don't we all make an agreement tonight? We're going to stay off the judge's seat. There's only one judge and I'm not it. said there's only one judge and I'm not it if it wasn't for a merciful judge one day in my life that decided in spite of my guilt to say I offer you forgiveness I offer you grace I offer you mercy if it wasn't for that I wouldn't be here and neither would you God let this be a place 
I don't mean just this physical place. I mean this group of people in this church, this body of believers. Let this be a city of refuge. Let this be a place where the stranger knows it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how messed up you've been. It doesn't matter the lifestyle you've lived. We've got a city for you. And there's a path that welcomes you into that place of refuge. Just let Jesus do his work. I said, just let Jesus do his work. If it takes a couple of days, fine. If it takes a couple of decades, fine. Our job is not to determine who stays in the city. Our job is not to decide, you know what, you've been here long enough. You don't get no, you, you, you're gone. No. No, no, no. That's not our job. It's not our job to decide, you know what, uh, so-and-so just doesn't seem to be changing. Chances are you might need to go look in the mirror. I'm learning more and more the things that agitate people the most about others. Things about others that bother you the most are usually the things that you got a problem with. People that are upset with everybody else being so judgmental are usually very judgmental people. All right, that's all right. I don't care. Let God work. Let grace work. Let mercy work. Let the Spirit work. But let's just keep an open road without any impediments. Let, let's make sure the bridges are all in order. Let's make sure where there's any crossroads and somebody's got to figure out the direction to go. Let's make sure there's a sign in the road that makes it clear there's a place of safety. Whomsoever will. Whomsoever. Commentary I just read was said that That phrase perhaps was also connected to Isaiah 40 and verse 1. Isaiah 40 and 1 says this, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. Don't make it hard to get to the city. Don't make it hard to get to the city. Yeah, I'm not here tonight. I'm not here tonight saying that we don't believe in being born again. I'm not here tonight saying you don't need the Holy Ghost and repent. I'm not saying that. I believe all of that. But God have mercy when we don't even let people get to there. Because we make it so hard, it's so difficult. We make the way so narrow. There's no room or there's obstacles or challenges. Let it not be said of us that the biggest obstacle on the road to the city of refuge is our attitudes. Our treatment of others. Sorry. You may need to start sitting someplace else, but I'll still call you out anyway. So, Brother brother Tommy's testimony and Brother Josh Lewis, he's at Maryland tonight. Responsible for Brother Tommy coming. Part of the testimony in the context of what I'm saying tonight, I'll just say it this way. He, he just He made a broad path. a broad path, not restrictive, not confining. You know what? The word in due time is more than able of sifting. (laughs) God doesn't need you and I jumping ahead on the process. 
I just read it again recently. And the Bible talks about when the wheat is growing, that, that the tares grow along with the wheat. But, but he says you don't go in and try to tear out the tares. The tares aren't wheat. They're, they're, they're rubbish. They're not useful. He said, but you don't, you don't go in while the, while the wheat is growing and, and, and almost ready to harp. You don't go in and try to weed out the tares because there's the chance that if you go in and try to weed out the tares, you're also going to mess up some wheat. been around long enough, I've been pastoring a long time now, and I've been in this all my life, and I've been old enough for enough years to observe for a long time now, some of the people that you think are going to be the next Apostle Paul, oh boy, be able to look out, they're going to they're gonna shake the world, but they're going to turn out to not do anything. And some people, you're just like, well, it's nice to have you. Hope you make it to heaven, but you probably ain't going to do a whole lot. You give it time. Let, let, let's, let, let's, let's leave the separating of the tares and the wheat. Let's leave that up to the Lord. How, how long should a person be allowed to come to church and participate in church and how long should we allow them to do that without changing things they need to change huh? how long how long you got the answer for that how long there ain't no answer well, I think they should have changed by now I think they shouldn't be struggling with that anymore probably the same thing could be said about you Our job is to maintain the roads. Our, our job is to provide access. Our, pro our job is to provide a city of refuge so the stranger can find that city and find a place of safety and security. And then our job is when the stranger gets in the city to not treat them like a stranger. You're not a stranger anymore, especially the moment you're born again. You are absolutely a fellow citizen because when you are born again, you are now a son of God. You have now entered the kingdom of God. We've all got growing and maturing and developing to do, but when you are born again at that moment, you are now a son. You are now a fellow citizen. I'm going to give you just one little example of what I think it kind of looks like to be grafted in. Genesis, would you would you stand? Genesis shared a little testimony with me a couple of weeks ago. I, I want her to read it. She's probably going to be a little bit nervous, but are you nervous? Oh, she's not. Uh-oh. How old are you? Fourteen. Almost 50. You know you're getting old when you're not talking about how almost you're going to be. You're hanging on to what you are. <laughs> Ask me on November 1st how old I am. I'm going to be whatever age I am right now. I don't care if the next day is the next age. I'm still what I was. So would you, would you read that testimony? Well, you can step over here in the middle. She said right here in the corner. No, not in the corner. Genesis, and my testi <laughs> um, <laughs> um, hi, my name is Genesis. Um, I can't see because of the light. I can't see because of the light. No, I can't.
Um, my name is Genesis. My testimony consists of my life story. I want to tell everyone how Jesus has made a positive impact in my life. When I was a kid, I remember living in a violent household. Um, my dad used to physically hurt my mom. He used to um, throw things at her. They used to argue often. Let me hold it because you can't hold it. Um, these bad memories stay in the bottom of my mind. For um, most of my childhood, I lived seeing and hearing violence. Um, when these arguments would happen, I would feel guilty um, because I used to think that it was my fault. When I was around four, um, he left. All those things have caused me to not be able to express my emotions. I prefer to keep things to myself. For a long time, I have felt alone because I didn't have my father's love. It felt like, you know, something in me wasn't complete. I didn't, I didn't feel loved. This feeling led me to bad choices that just hurt me more, and they have caused me to feel more empty. Well, because I don't know where I'm reading. <laughs> okay, yeah, this led me to bad choices that just hurt me more, and they have caused me to feel more empty. All of these feelings made me turn to Jesus. Um, he, fe he fills the emptiness with joy. Every time I come to church, my heart fills with joy as I sing and praise. I feel a sense of calmness. And I feel like all of my problems disappear. As I pray, I feel his presence. This makes me feel a lot better because due to legal situations, I can't see my dad. But I always keep him in my prayers and hope the best. Turning to Jesus has been one of my best decisions. Turning to him has opened a lot of doors for me. For example, I recently applied to three magnet programs for high school. And I got accepted to all three of them. <laughs> Also, also, I got accepted um, to the U.S. Naval Academy. It's um, a engineering thing where I have a whole team. I have to build a robot that works underwater. Um, Jesus has opened a lot of doors for me. He has made me realize that after any storm, there will always be a rainbow. Now, as I'm making my relationship stronger with Jesus, I choose to forgive my dad for all the pain that he has caused me and my mom. And I know that by doing this, I'm breaking every chain of pain for my future generations. I learned that Jesus can fill me up in a way that no one can. He fills me with joy, and although I have gone through many obstacles, I know I can always count on Jesus. I know that he... I know that he will open more doors for me as time goes by. He has made a big change in me now. I look forward to coming to church and praying. I look forward to being in his presence. And now I know that by going in the right path, everything I do or accomplish will be filled with grace. And I want to tell everyone to find the love in him because it is the purest love you can find. And he will be the only one to never leave your side. Thank you. Young, old, male, female, rich, poor, anywhere in between. It's a place where the stranger doesn't have to be a stranger anymore. That you and I have been given the privilege and the opportunity not only to create a place of refuge, but to make sure that anybody and everybody that wants to get inside that place of refuge can make their way there. I want you to stand, if you would, please. Usually is. You know, when we do altar call at the end, it's more of an individual type of thing. But I'm going to make a mass appeal this evening to this congregation. I believe with all of my heart. I don't, I don't want to sound redundant, but I, I believe with all of my heart the things we've been seeing and experiencing so far this year are simply the trickle of what God is going to do in this congregation this year and in the future. I, I, want, I want to make sure 
that God can completely trust us. We're going to do our part. Whatever stranger he may send, we're going to make sure they can get to the city. We're going to make sure that when they make it there, we're not going to, I'm not, I'm not, throwing all the things we believe and teach and preach out the window tonight, but God's more than capable of taking care of all of that if we'll just do what's our part. God can convict. God can deal with people about the things that need to change. He doesn't need you to fix them. Our job is just to create the city and create the way to get there and make sure that we maintain it so that whomsoever wants to come I wonder if I could invite everybody that's a part of this congregation that would. Could we just could we just make a mass offering of ourselves this evening? Not just individually to say, God, I, I want to do my part to, to help the stranger be at home, to help the stranger be. But God, we are we are responding as a congregation. Expressing tonight that as a congregation, our desire. We want to be a place, God. We want to be a place where the stranger, the sojourner, where the, where the one that's running from his mistakes and running from his past has, has got a place to run to. Got a place of safety and security. A, a place that there's going to be open arms waiting. not going to be a bunch of obstacles you got to overcome to get to that city not a bunch of challenges you got to if you want in you're welcome if you want to be a fellow citizen you're welcome lord right now we present ourselves to you tonight god by the power of your spirit lord you your word is expresses even more than i've shared tonight your your concern, your compassion for the stranger and the efforts that you went to, God, to make them a place for them to find of safety and security and healing and wholeness. God, we want to be that place. We want to be a place, God, where we make sure that there are no obstacles that hinder and prevent those that are trying to find safety, trying to find healing hope and wholeness in the name of Jesus God it doesn't matter how far down somebody may have gone it doesn't matter the pit they may have been in God there's a there's a place of refuge there's a place God for them to be not a stranger not an outsider but a place to be a fellow citizen in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Some of you are already doing it, but why don't you, if you would, just, just grab a hand of somebody beside you or put a hand on a shoulder of somebody beside you. I realize this takes us doing our part individually, but again, I just feel like here this evening we're, we're presenting ourselves collectively. Making a collective statement tonight, God. I, I know that for this to happen, I know... F- that for this to be a place of refuge and safety and security, that, that means each one of us individually has to do our part. But God, we're standing collectively tonight to say to you, we want this to be a place, God. We want this to be a place of refuge. We want it to be a place where the stranger comes and doesn't stay a stranger they become fellow citizens in the name of Jesus God I pray that you would baptize us afresh tonight with your compassion I pray God that you would baptize us afresh tonight with your love oh God let your love flow through us Lord Let your love flow through us, Lord. Let your love flow through us, Lord. 
In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, here we are, Lord. Here we are. We want to be available. God, in a world that's full of broken people, full of wounded people, God, let this be a place of refuge. Let it be a place of healing, a place of wholeness, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Lord, whether it's the sinner or the prodigal that's coming home, it doesn't matter. Let there be a clear path. Let there be a wide road for them to be able to make it to the place of refuge, Lord, to find what they need. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. 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 In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost is still working in some lives in this place. Come on, if you don't need something, would you just be a conduit right now? Even if that's even if that's just simply standing where you are and singing and presenting yourself. In the name of Jesus.
Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use with me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Take my hands, Lord. Take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak to me. If you can use anything, anything, Lord, you can, can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. There are some that are still praying, so please be mindful of that. But whenever you need to go or want to go, you're welcome to do so. In Jesus' name.